thanks. And uh, thanks everyone for coming. So uh, I'm Rob, and uh, I like to study things that are weird in the universe and extreme. So uh, one of the things I spend a lot of time on is something called magnetars, which is something I'm going to tell you about today and why I, I kind of think they're some of the coolest objects in the universe, which is, you know, sort of a biased opinion as everyone thinks what they research is the coolest. But, you know, take what you get. Anyway, so one thing you might want to wonder is uh, what is a magnetar? Which is sort of, uh, you know, a good question if you see the title of the talk. It's, for first thing to know is it's part of the stellar graveyard. So th what that means is in order to get a magnetar, you need a star to go through all its life and then end up, end up as a dead thing in the middle of nowhere. But if we take a star like our sun, so our sun conveniently weighs exactly as much as the sun weighs, and when it goes through its life, when it burns through all its hydrogen, as stars do, it, it takes a really, really long time. So a star like our sun is around for like about tens of billions of years, which is, you know, good. So it allows us to evolve on Earth and everything. <coughs> but uh, once, it, once it ends its life, once it goes through all its fuel, it'll sort of yawn its way out and push out all its outer layers in, into a big, pretty thing called a planetary nebula, which may be the worst named thing in astronomy. It has nothing at all to do with planets. It's called planetary because it looks round from a small telescope. But anyway, uh, this, if you, at the end of our sun's life, it will do something like this and puff out all its outer layers into this big, pretty nebula. But at the very center of this nebula, you'll be left with something that's about the size of Earth, so, you know, much smaller than the sun, but still has most of the sun's mass. And this thing's called a white dwarf. And this is one of the main uh, stellar graveyards in, for the fate of most stars in, uh, in the universe. But cooler things happen when we get us to stars that are bigger. So if you start with a star that's about 10 times the mass of our sun, 10 times bigger, it'll go through its life a lot faster. Instead of living for like 10 billion years, it'll, it'll only live for about 30 billion years. So the, you know, sort of the bigger the star is, the faster it goes through its life and dies. And then when these die, when bigger stars die, they do it in cool giant explosions. So they explode in a big supernova and we're left with something like this. So this is the Crab supernova remnant. This is, a, this is a Hubble picture of the Crab supernova remnant. And we know this star exploded in 1054 AD because uh, some uh, astronomers, especially in China, wrote down when it happened and uh, watched it sort of, at first you could see it during the day and then they tracked it. It was then the brightest star in the sky and uh, so on and so on. But if we look at it today, we see this big, pretty nebula, which is light years across. But at the very, very center of this is uh, something called a neutron star, which is, uh, yeah, which is something that's about the mass of our sun, except now instead of squeezing it inside of the, uh, into about the size of the Earth, like we do for a white dwarf, we're going to shove it in something the size of like Toronto. And so the first answer to the question, so what is a magnetar? So a, a magnetar is a, t is a special kind of these neutron stars. So the special thing that happens when a massive star ends its life. And, uh, but, it, this, but this is just one part of what makes a magnetar. And we'll get on, we'll see more of this as we go through the talk. So neutron stars in general are the densest things we know about. And what does that really mean? You know, density is kind of a weird thing. So I thought I'd put it in the most intuitive units possible in terms of clown cars. So if, for those of you not familiar, clowns possess this magical property where you can take as many clowns as you possibly want and they can all just fit inside this clown car. They have, you know, they have their very well-trained clowns. They can do it without getting hurt and then they can all pile back out as humor, you know, humorously pile back out when they're done doing whatever they do inside clown cars. But uh, the tip, the, the, you know, a clown car is a pretty small car. I think like the size of a smart, smart car, so like a cubic meter or so. And we're going to see what happens when we start piling clowns inside this car. So if we just put one clown in there, one clown inside the smart car, 
that's about the same density as a, as a block of styrofoam. So that's, you know, that's really light. The, the, whole, the whole mass of the clown can take up as much of the car as it wants. And so that's a pretty light thing. But uh, then we start putting more clowns in. By the time we get to 15 clowns in there, so you pack 15 clowns inside the smart car, you're probably selling most crevices of the car now, and now you'll, you'll reach about the same density as water. So, uh, you know, that's about the same density as humans. So right now these clowns are at like maximum uh, amount of people you could reasonably fit inside the smart car. But we're just gonna keep cramming clowns in there as we go along. So if we shove more clowns in, by the time we get to about 100 clowns, we're at the density of iron. And this is about the densest thing I deal with on a daily, daily basis, like picking up a frying pan, you know, those are heavier than they look. And you know, that's, you know, that's really pretty dense. But uh, we're not gonna stop there. If we keep cramming clowns in, by the time we uh, get 300 clowns, we're at about the density of gold. So just as a reminder, if you're ever in Fort Knox and trying to steal gold bricks, gold is really heavy. Go for a smaller piece than you think, because otherwise it'll be hard to pick up. You know, it's about 30 times denser than water. So, you know, if I'm picking up this little water bottle, it's like picking up a water bottle that's 30 times bigger. So, you know, just remember that next time you're robbing Fort Knox. And this is... This is about as dense as, you, as we get on Earth. You can, there are some slightly denser metals, so the densest thing we know about on Earth is called osmium. It's a weird metal, but it, it only really has a density of about 350 clowns per clown car, uh, and that's about as dense as we get on Earth. So in order to get uh, denser than that, we're gonna have to sort of start going, going away from Earth. So when we do that, sort of the densest place around in the center of the sun is about 2,000 clowns per clown car. And you know, that's pretty really dense. Like that's, that's dense enough that it's at the center of the sun, you're squeezing hydrogen into, you know, you're smashing them together enough to make helium. So you're dense enough to make nuclear fusion go on. And you know, that's, uh, you know, pretty dense as far as I'm concerned. And uh, at this point, you know, we're already denser than we are in the solar system. So we'll have to start going into the stellar graveyard to find anything sort of denser than this. So if we do that, we'll go about to talk about the white dwarf. And at this point, so the white dwarf in this image is a wee tiny little thing on the side. So this is a thing that's about the size of Earth and weighs about as much as the sun. That's at about the density of 15 million clowns shoved into that one little tiny smart car. So, you know, at this point, you have half the population of Canada shoved inside this car and, uh, you know, you're nowhere, and we're still nowhere near the density of, uh, of, a, of a neutron star. So, um, you know, we're nowhere near this density. So, if we think about Earth, Earth has about 7 billion people. I assume by now 15 million people we've run out of clowns. But if we take, so we're going to need to send everyone to clown college. So we'll take all seven billion people on Earth, send them to clown college, train them in the intricate arts of, of uh, how to get in, into and out of clown cars safely. And if we then take all seven billion people on Earth and make them get into that car, we st we're still not dense enough. So you've squeezed the entire population of Earth into this one smart car, and we're still nowhere near the density of a neutron star. These things are crazy dense. So in order, to, in order to see how dense they are, we need to take our clown car, which is already pretty small, and then shrink it. So now instead of taking a, one, you know, a smart car size thing, we're gonna take like a matchbox car, something where the inside is about the size of a sugar cube. Uh, and then if we take all seven billion people on Earth who are newly graduated from clown college, and we shove them inside this one tiny little car, we're now at the density of a neutron star, and that's pretty crazy. That's really dense. Like, that's a, that's a lot of mass in one place. So just to sort of put that in context, here's a map of Toronto and the surrounding areas. When you squeeze things that dense, you can fit somewhere between one and two times the mass of our sun. You can just fit it right there in sort of the whole, sort of just the Toronto bit of the greater Toronto area. So we can just fit you know, one and a half, you know, sometimes up to two times the mass of our sun, we can squeeze into something the size of Toronto. And you might be wondering, you know, what, what happens to matter when you do that? That's crazy. Like, 
I, I think gold is pretty dense, and this is, you know, billions of times denser than gold. And uh, the, so to answer that question, I'm going to show you a very technical diagram which you'll find in almost any uh, textbook you open on neutron stars. There's a big question mark. <laughs> we, 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 don't, we don't really know. We don't know what's happening inside the uh, centers of these things. Like, they're so dense, people have a lot of different theories about what might happen to matter when you try to squeeze it that dense. We can't get anywhere near that density on Earth. So when we study these neutron stars, one of the things we want to find out is what exactly happens when you take the population of Earth and shove them into a sugar cube. How does, uh, how does matter respond? And, you know, right now, we, we're, we're not really sure. Okay, so now you might be wondering, how do we possibly see these things? These things are like, t you know, the size of Toronto, and now you're putting them at distances somewhere, somewhere in the galaxy. You know, that's a pretty small thing to see that pretty that far away. Uh, and the answer is kind of cool. Is that uh, in addition to when you cram matter that small, uh, a lot of these neutron stars are spinning. And uh, every time they spin around, they sort of flash us. You, it's like a lighthouse. Uh, and the reason is, these things, in addition to have being you know, this really, really dense thing, they also have a magnetic field. And when you spin a magnet for you know, complicated physics reasons, you get light out. <laughs> uh, but conveniently, these, uh, uh, conveniently, it's sort of really convenient. Every time the star rotates, it, it sends out a little pulse and we can go, oh, that star spun around once, it spun around again and again, and we can uh, see these things really regularly, and this is how we learn most things we know about, pulse, about these neutron stars, is by studying these pulses. So because of that, pretty much any neutron star we see, we see them because they're rotating and doing this sort of lighthouse flashing. So we call them pulsars, because when we see them on Earth, they look like they're pulsing. We just see pulse after pulse of every single rotation. So this is how we learn about these really dense, really cool things. So that's sort of the next step in sort of defining what a magnetar is. Magnetar is a special kind of pulsar. So it's already a special kind of neutron star. It's one that we see as a pulsar. But it also does things that no other pulsars do, which we'll start to see in the next, you know, next few minutes. Including being the brightest thing we've ever seen in the entire history of Earth, in, aside from one little caveat there, the sun. The sun's really bright. It's right there. It's hard to outshine the sun from uh, you know, really far away. But aside from that, Magnetars have produced the brightest thing we've ever seen on Earth since the dawn of astronomy. And just to remind us, it's the brightest thing we've ever seen, but we have to remember that light comes in lots of different colors. So most of the light, when we think of light, we think of the colors of the rainbow, you know, sort of the, the light we call visible light because we can see it. But there's still light that's redder than, than the reddest color we see, called infrared light, and we, see, we feel it as heat. It happens when the wavelength of light is about the size of the point of a needle. And you can keep going longer and longer. And eventually you'll get into radio light, which radio waves are just another kind of light. But just like that, <coughs> just like we can go redder than red, we can also go bluer than blue, the bluest light we see. And we start with ultraviolet, the light that, you get, you know, that gives you a sunburn when you go outside in summer. Or you can keep going and get to, get to light that's, that's even more blue. The wavelength gets shorter and shorter until it's about the size of molecules or atoms. And this is light that we call X-rays and gamma rays. And this is, this is you know, light. It's just like the light that you and I are seeing right now. It's just it has a lot more energy, and it has lots of shorter wavelengths. But because it's light, just like I can build a telescope, and or I can't build a telescope, but other people can build a telescope and take these beautiful pictures in optical light. So here's the picture of the Crab Nebula again. We can look at the same part of the sky with an X-ray telescope, and we'll see a slightly different thing. So here's a, an image of that same part of the sky, the Crab Nebula, 
the Crab Supernova Remnant, and we can take a picture of it in optical with the Hubble Space Telescope, or we can take a picture of it the same way using, uh, this is a picture taken with the Chandra X-ray Observatory. But, uh, so, but this is a picture taken with X-ray light, and we see that um, it, a lot, some of the features of the nebula look the same, like it's still sort of blobby and nebula-y, but at the center here in X-ray, you see that one bright dot in the center? That one bright dot in the center is one of these neutron stars. It's called the Crab Pulsar. And that thing is spinning around at uh, th about 30 times every second. And it's powering this whole big nebula that you're seeing around it, which is, you know, ha you know th this whole thing is like light years across. And it's all powered by that tiny little thing in the middle. But uh, anyway, these are pictures we can take with X-ray. But um, luckily for us, um, Earth's atmosphere absorbs some kind of colors. In order to take that picture in x-rays, we had to go to space. And the reason is Earth's atmosphere blocks out a lot of the light. You know, this is good for us humans because, you know, we don't really want to be constantly bombarded by x-rays and gamma rays. You know, you get lots of cancers and unpleasant things and, you know, it wouldn't be good. But, you know, as an astronomer, it's kind of annoying. You have to spend all your money and put your telescopes up in space, uh, which, you know, it, it, it takes a lot of time and money. But, uh, you know, we can do it. So in order to take uh, pictures of things in X-rays and gamma rays, or even some bits at other wavelengths, we need to put our telescopes in space. Otherwise, the atmosphere sucks up all the light. And... Um, so we can do this, and what, one such telescope, the one I'm going to show you that saw the brightest thing we've ever seen, uh, it was taken, it's called the Neil Gerl Swift Observatory. So this was a mission that was launched in uh, 2003. It was originally called the Swift Gamma Ray Burst Mission, because its mission was to find gamma ray bursts. But uh, just this last year was renamed after Niels Gerrels, who unfortunately passed away last year. He uh, led the mission, so they renamed this telescope in honor of him. But, uh, but it's an X-ray telescope, so it needs to be in space. And in fact, this is not just one X-ray telescope. It's actually a UV telescope, and then it has two different X-ray telescopes on it. But in order to understand why, I, I, I'm going to show you a couple plots that I think are some of the coolest things in, uh, in astronomy. But uh, we need to understand a couple technical details about telescopes. And that is, telescopes look in one direction. So this telescope looks that way. You might notice that if you've ever looked through a telescope or you know, just gone like this with your eyes, you, you only see in one direction. I can only see the people you know, directly in front of me. I can't see anyone back there. Um, but that makes the next thing I'm going to show you kind of weird. Um, what, when this thing saw the brightest uh, thing we had ever seen, the explosion went off over there. It went off way out of the field of view of the telescope. It was 105 degrees away from where the telescope was looking. And I'm going to show you what the telescope saw. It saw this. So this is a plot of how bright the X-ray light is as a function of time. So here, there's about five minutes of light plotted here. So one thing you'll notice is that peak. The first thing you might notice is that peak goes way off the top of the screen. And just to sort of put this in context, this baseline level here, that's the rest of the X-ray sky. That's everything else in the sky. All the light from every single source in the, in the X-ray sky is in that, that baseline curve. And that makes every one of these bumps, these bumps, just to give it away, are, pul are pulses, one rotation of the, these neutron stars. What, each one of these bumps is one, one spin period of the neutron star. So this one, every seven and a bit seconds, turns around once, and we see this really bright curve. So to put this in perspective, any one of those what look like little bumps, without that spike, those would be the brightest thing we've ever seen. This, this spike, though, it went through the side of this telescope, and it, it saturated every pixel. and. Uh, What's really cool about that is, you know, x-rays go through things, right? We use them to take images of our, the insides of our, like our bones and things at the hospital. So in order to prevent this, it, in directions the telescope doesn't want to look, 
it, it's shielded from the rest of the sky. So be, if it comes out behind it, where this one almost came, it has to go through the whole body of the telescope. And if it goes sort of around the side, they've wrapped the telescope in 24 kilograms of lead, plus a bunch of other metals, and all the, all the, you know, all the rest of the telescope this thing went through. And on this, uh, on this plot, if I were to plot that peak that goes off the top of the page, you know, where this, you know, on the projector here, this is about a meter high, that would stretch all the way, that peak of light would stretch all the way from here to Niagara Falls. So that thing was really, really bright. And that's, that, that peak went through 24 kilograms of lead through the side of the telescope where it's not supposed to be looking, which is, I, I think, pretty impressive. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, and the thing that did that, so here's sort of a, a rep here's a picture of a spiral galaxy, kind of like our Milky Way, and I'm going to use it as sort of a map of the Milky Way, the galaxy where we live. So we're somewhere over here on this outskirts. The magnetar that did that, that made the brightest thing we've ever, ever seen happen, it's over there. It's like as far away in the galaxy as you can get. It's about 30,000 light years away. Um, it made... It, it made that spike that was the brightest thing we'd ever seen, outshone every other X-ray source in the sky by a factor of 100 million. And so from across the galaxy, this sky, this little tiny thing the size of Toronto, outshone everything else in the X-ray sky, including things you may have heard of, like the sun. And, you know, it was uh, that's, uh, pretty impressive for something that's at the, like, the kitty corner of the galaxy. And we call these things from magnetars giant flares because we like simple names. And we've seen three of these since, the, the, since, since we've had uh, things in space. Like it's pretty hard not to see these things when they go off. We've seen three of them, once in 1979, once in 1998, and the one I just showed you happened in uh, 2004, uh, which is kind of cool. So these things are reasonably rare, but they're, you know, pretty impressively bright. And, uh, yeah. So, you might think, if these things are that bright, why would I need a telescope? And you might be right. So, as we saw earlier, we saw that Earth's atmosphere absorbs some colors of light, including X-rays and gamma rays. But when Earth, you know, the energy doesn't just disappear. The energy has to go somewhere. So, we can use Earth as a giant X-ray gamma ray detector, which is... Uh, which I think is pretty cool. This giving this talk might be an excuse to show people what I think is the coolest plot in all of astronomy, which uh, wasn't actually made by astronomers. It was made by atmospheric scientists. But uh, you know, bear with me a minute because I'm just going to have to, you know, hype this up a little bit. <laughs> so, you know, this might not be surprising, but Earth's atmosphere looks different at night and day. At day, you have the sun there. The sun is really bright, and in 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 and it's also really bright at colors that we can't see, like in the UV and the X-ray. And th when uh, light is sort of that, has that much energy, it can knock electrons off of uh, molecules in the atmosphere and ionize the atmosphere. So there's a big part of the atmosphere, the odor atmosphere, that's called the ionosphere because it's full of ions or charged uh, atoms. Yeah. And it looks different at day and night. At day, it's it, you know, at day, it, there's light shining on it, so it gets all puffy and it gets all ionized. And at night, not so much. And people like who like to study the atmosphere often do it by bouncing radio waves around. Now, uh, in a, because of the ionosphere looks different at day and night, radio waves bounce around differently uh, from. Uh, uh, at Earth at day and night. You might, re you might uh, if you've ever listened to AM radio or things, you might realize you can pick up stations that are really far away at night and not so much at the day. That's because at day, Earth's atmosphere is really ionized, so when the wave goes up and tries to bounce off the atmosphere, it bounces really low in the atmosphere because it's ionized a lot of the way down. And then so your light doesn't make it very far. Whereas at night, it can go up a lot higher. There's no sun there to ionize the atmosphere. And then we can get, we, you can see radio waves really far away. And people use this technique to study the, atmos to study the ionosphere. People, uh, to, 
uh, usually to study things like how climate is and you know what's going on with lightning storms because that'll change the ionosphere. But uh, to, to do this, they bounce radio waves pretty much all around Earth. So at the, the, there's a picture of Earth up there with the radio stations marked. They have one in Antarctica, there's one in Hawaii, there are a couple in North America. And what they really pretty much look at is the strength of the radio signal they're getting from other signals as um, and it looks different at day and night. At day, you don't really get much radio signal, so it's way down at, there at zero. And at night, uh, you, get a lot, you get some amount of radio signal, so you get a lot more signal. And you don't have to remember any of this, just remember that you know, at night our atmosphere looks, uh, looks like that, it's high, and at day it looks like that. Okay, so here's another one of these giant flares. This is the 1998 giant flare from another magnetar. And so this is just like the light curve we saw before, uh, where we have bright, how bright the X-ray light is as a function of time. And again, that's about five minutes. Uh, it's how long they last. The little spike at the top is about 100 milliseconds. And then we have a you know, minutes long tail. But uh, this is light seen by another X-ray telescope in space. And now I'm going to show you uh, what the data that, the, uh, that the, the scientists studying the ionosphere were seeing. So this flare went off when it was night at Earth where these radio stations were. And this is what they saw. They saw the Earth's ionosphere changed instantly from looking like it does at night to looking like it does in the day. So this thing, you know, from across the galaxy made Earth's ionosphere, if you were just looking at this, you would say it immediately turned from night into day. And what I find even cooler is if we zoom in on the, on the tip of that plot, uh, what will we see this? See these sort of wiggles? Those wiggles are at exactly the spin period of the magnetar that's across the galaxy. Like, so those wiggles, those are at about 5.2 seconds. That's exactly the same wiggles you see in the, in the X-ray light curve up here. They're at exactly the same period. So something from across the galaxy, this magnetar was even slightly further away. It was about 40,000 light years away. From, a, from all the way across the galaxy, something the size of Toronto made Earth's atmosphere pulse at its spin period. So Earth's atmosphere was going from looking like it does at, at night to day to almost back to night to day and sort of wiggling back up from all the way across the galaxy, which I think is uh, pretty cool. But, you know, I'll just take a second and tell you not to worry. Uh, <laughs> in order to destroy Earth's atmosphere to do any sort of serious harm to us, you'd have to have a magnetar that's about as close as the nearest star. And the nearest ones we know about are nowhere near that close. The nearest neutron star we know of is hundreds of light years away, and even if it were a magnetar, which it wasn't, it, it's still not close enough to, uh, to do any serious harm to Earth's atmosphere. It might, you know, knock out your satellite TV for, for a few minutes or something, but, you know, nothing nothing to worry about terribly much. Okay, so you might think, how do these things possibly get that bright? Where are they getting all this energy? So you might think, hey, I have a lot of mass. It's spinning really fast. If you've, uh, is every, everyone knows what those like merry-go-round rides are at the, uh, like at, at kids, at like a playground where you spin them around and go really fast. If you ever try to stop those things, you know that heavy spinning things carry a lot of energy. And so most pulsars, most of normal pulsars that we see are powered from that. There's a lot of energy stored in really big spinning, you know, fast spinning things. But if we try to get, uh, if we try to use that to power a, a magnetar, it's nowhere near enough energy. So uh, it's, it's nowhere near enough energy by like a factor of a million. So it's like not even in the ballpark. So, so that doesn't work. It works for most pulsars, but not for these cool magnetars, which can, you know, outshine the entire X-ray sky. Another way to get energy out of these, out of things, is by chucking rocks at them, or chucking uh, mass, you know, some, something heavy at them. Because when you chuck something heavy at a neutron star, it's so dense that, uh, you know, you, you know that when you drop something, it go, you know, it, it, it goes faster and faster and hits the ground. 
neutron stars are so dense, the gravity is so strong, when you throw something at it, by the time it hits the surface, it's about the, it's about the size of a nuclear explosion. Like you get a lot, a lot of energy out of dropping mass onto a neutron star just because they're so dense. And you, you build up a lot of speed before you hit the surface. And that's a good way of powering things. We see a lot of things in the uh, X-ray sky are powered like this, where in this case, this is called, uh, this is, we have a, a, a neutron star there, the tiny white dot at the middle. And this is an artist's impression of, wh of what, the, what you think is going on in these things. And if they have a companion star, if that companion star gets too close, the, the, the matter on that star is more attracted to the uh, neutron star than it is to the, its, its, its own star and sort of falls in. And you can power a lot of light that way. But you can't get as bright as a magnetar, and it's for kind of a cool reason, is that light gives pressure. So you might remember a couple years ago the, the Planetary Society put up this big thing in space called the light sail, and it's based on, the, it's based on this really cool idea that, uh, that light has pressure. So if you shine, uh, you can use the light coming from the sun, like a sailing ship uses wind, and you can use light to push things. And the, if you try to get, uh, if you try to dump mass on a neutron star, enough mass to put out all the light we see, in order to do that, you'd have to put something, some, something like uh, an Earth, of, uh, yeah, an entire Earth of mass into the neutron star in less than 100 milliseconds to explain that big spike that you know would stretch from here to Niagara Falls. Uh, the light that light is going to put out a lot of pressure and it's not going to let mass fall onto the neutron star fast enough. So you just can't get that energy out. So it works to power a bunch of things in the X-ray sky, but it doesn't work for magnetars. We just can't, it's not bright enough and we can't get this to happen fast enough. It takes a, you know, it's hard to make something that, you know, uh, an Earth mass, slam it into a neutron star, and get, the, and get all that energy out in that 100 millisecond spike. It's, it's really hard. We can't do that, or we don't know how to do that. So the answer might be a giveaway. It's in the name. Uh, it's ludicrously strong magnetic fields. We call them magnetars because they're stars with really big magnetic fields. And unfortunately, I don't know the magnetic field of a clown, so I don't have a really <laughs> clever analogy for this, nor do I really have a good intuition for how strong magnetic fields are. I can tell you the uh, magnetic field that, uh, that spins around your compass is, a, uh, is you know, that's how much um, magnetic field Earth has. The average pulsar, just like your run-of-the-mill average pulsar, has a, a magnetic field that's about a billion times stronger than that, and a magnetar is then a million times stronger than that, so it's a million billion times stronger than Earth's magnetic field, which is turning your compass. And uh, that's crazy, so that if you put one of these things at the distance of the moon, it wipes out all your credit cards. I mean, at that point, at that point, you know, it's close enough that Earth is going to fall into it and we're all going to die. But uh, your credit cards won't work, so we'll focus on the important things. Uh, but, you know, that's really, you know, that's a really strong magnetic field. And the thing about magnetic fields is um, they're a good way of storing energy and getting that energy out quickly. And we, we don't have to look all the way to magnetars to see this happen. We see these things happen on our sun to a much, much, much smaller scale. See all this like fuzzy bits at the side of the star? These are, uh, these are due to the sun's magnetic field not being like perfectly, you know, not round, but you know, not nicely aligned. When magnetic field lines, uh, sometimes they'll get twisted and they don't really like being twisted. When they get twisted, they'll tend to snap and put out all the, a lot of energy. And we see this. So here's a, uh, here's a movie, a GIF from uh, the uh, Taken of the Sun by NASA's uh, Solar Dynamics Observatory. And you see the big explosion happening at the bottom uh, corner of the plot. That's what happens when a magnetic field line twists. When, it, when a magnetic field line, you get a little twist in it, you can put out a lot, a lot of energy um, 
pretty quickly. So that this is not quite real time, but you know, you can put out a lot of energy really quickly. And you can imagine if you make that magnetic field a million billion times stronger than the magnetic field of Earth, or which is oddly enough about the magnetic field of the sun, you can put out a lot, a lot of energy really quickly. And this is what we think is powering these giant flares. Uh, empowering these magnetars, which do th cool things like outshine the rest of the sky. So anyway, that's mostly what I wanted to tell you, that uh, reasons why I think magnetars are cool, in that they're the densest place in the universe, you know, seven billion people on Earth shoved into a sugar cube, that's pretty dense. They're also responsible for the brightest things we've ever seen. They only last for like 100 milliseconds or so, these brightest things we've ever seen. But you know, that's still impressive to me that this one tiny thing the size of Toronto can outshine the rest of the universe, you know, even briefly. And uh, that they also are home to the strongest magnetic fields in the universe, you know, the strongest ones we know about, you know, a million billion times stronger than the one we have on Earth. And uh, that makes these things really cool places to study sort of where our current knowledge of physics breaks down. Because you're combining, you know, we don't know how matter behaves when it's that dense. We don't really know how, um, how magnetic fields act when you get them that, that dense. They're, they're, slight, they're stronger than we think, than we used to think that the strongest magnetic field you could get was. So with that, I think I'd leave you with what I think are the cool things magnetars do, and I'll be happy to take any questions. is that when you that all stars have a magnetic field and then when you try to crush it crush it all the way down you conserve the sort of total amount of magnetic field except now instead of putting it in a giant star you're shoving it down into something the size of Toronto so you ramp up the magnetic field a lot like that and we call them neutron stars but we don't really know what's in the middle. We, but there are layers in there that we know are conductive and can hold currents for magnetic fields. But, uh, but you know, it seems to work. Yeah, so we think there is, and we think these things are pushing it. So these things are about, at, at some point, uh, when you have a magnetic field, it's storing energy. And uh, we think there's an upper limit to how much energy you can put into one little bit of space before it's, you know, things start to go haywire, at least we don't understand what will happen. And these things are within like a factor of 10 or 100 of where these things br are breaking down. And we're not exactly sure what will happen if you just cranked it up a little more. Um, it's a light from the magnetar hit the telescope at a 105 degree angle. Mm -hmm. Ah, that's a good question. So the question is, if, we, if the light from the telescope didn't hit the front of the telescope, how do we know where it came from? And the answer is, we saw it with other telescopes. Uh, it's kind of cool, Every everything in space saw it, whether or not it was a telescope. So it's kind of cool, you, uh, we, have, we have probes in orbit around Mars, we have, them, we have a bunch of things looking at the sun. So I showed you this video from uh, Solar Dynamics Observatory. There are a bunch of telescopes, including ones looking at the sun, that weren't looking at the magnetar but saw the light. And based on w when the light hit all those telescopes, we could tell where it came from. And when you look, when we looked about where that was, there was a really bright, you know, still really bright X-ray source, nowhere near the hundred million times brighter than the rest of the sky, just a few times brighter. 
and, and fading. And it had, and when you looked at that thing, it was pulsing at exactly the same period as those pulsations you saw in the tail of the giant flare, which is a pretty good argument for, oh yeah, it's probably that guy. Yeah, so uh, the question is, do we have any idea about uh, what's in the, the center of a neutron star? And the, the answer is some people very firmly believe they know what's in the center of neutron stars, and other people very firmly believe that other things are at the center of neutron stars. And it's fun, you can go to conferences and see people getting into yelling matches over it. But uh, we think it's, we're, we're, there are a bunch of different theories, but there, it's, it's mostly like exotic particles that I've barely heard of. So it's just sort of all crushed together really small. Oh. Or, or, or do they all hit the Earth because oh. they spin enough that we'll see it eventually? Yeah, so the question is how many pulsars are out there if they have a tiny beam? And the answer is a lot. So we, we know of right now about 3,000 pulsars that we've seen because their beam hits Earth. And we know, uh, and uh, we think based on how, we, how wide we think these beams are, based on watching some pulsars that are in binaries like spin around and you see more of the beam, and based on how many pulsars we see at some wavelengths but not others, we think there are something like 100,000 observable pulsars in the galaxy. So, you know, quite a few. And that's just our galaxy. Yeah, that's just our galaxy. Then every other galaxy should have its own, you know, 100,000 or more. <laughs> Ah, so what happens if a neutron star gets close to a black hole? That's one of the holy grails of pulsar astronomy. We keep wanting to find a pulsar that's really close to a black hole, because then we can do lots of cool things, like test all kinds of things about the black holes, because pulsars do this nice thing where they spin around really regularly. They're like perfect clocks. And if you get a clock close to a black hole, you can sort of study all the weird things that happen and sort of learn all kinds of cool things about it. We've been looking for one for the 50 years since we found, since uh, pulsars were first discovered uh, in 1967, uh, but we haven't quite found one yet. So, but as long as it's not really, really close, it'll still be fine. It's not until they ram into each other that, you know, that the pulsars are going to notice. It's, it's really hard to get x-rays through the atmosphere. So if, if, I were to, if I had like an x-ray machine right here and we're beaming x-rays towards you, most the, uh, by the time the, the x-rays got a meter away, there'd only be 10% of how many I put in originally. So by the time they got to you, you know, you're what, 10, 15 meters away from me, you're gonna drop down by, you know, you're, gonna, you're not gonna see any x-rays. So luckily our atmosphere is really, really good at it. So unless the, uh, is really good at absorbing x-rays and gamma rays. So unless this thing goes off like right next to us, which there are not anywhere, anywhere near that close, it really doesn't have enough energy to damage our atmosphere. Ah, so, so we've only seen three of these giant flares, but uh, sometimes magnetars do things that aren't quite this extreme. So we've seen several thousand, maybe even tens of thousands now of, of little blips. They'll put out like one or sometimes they'll just put out one of these little blips that are 
you know, little blips, you know, they are the brightest thing in the X-ray sky for like a fraction of a second, but still only like a few times brighter than most things. And sometimes we'll put out one of those, and sometimes they will put out tens of thousands in a day or two, and we study them like that. As well, sometimes they just decide that for, they're just ticking along, ticking along, and then they decide they just want to get a hundred times brighter and then fade over the time scale of a year. So we've only seen three of these giant flares, but we've seen a lot of other behavior from magnetars that, that um, sort of points towards magnetic fields. You'll, you know, it's, it's the best working theory we have for why these things work anyway. Um, so the creme that you love when it's reasonably young, mm -hmm. this one's a magnetar, so do they decay into more regular neutron stars and is there a state change between each of those layers that is lost energy? Yeah, yeah, so the question is uh, do magnetars, how are magnetars related to the rest of the pulsar pop pulsars? Do they turn into normal pulsars afterwards? And uh, the answer is we, we've, we've seen some pulsars display some magnetar behaviors, none of these giant flare things, but some of the, the little short blips I was talking about earlier. And it seems like, yeah, magnetars tend to be really young stars, like uh, re really young dead stars, uh, <laughs> really young, so like only we see them, they're only like a few thousand years after their supernova is when they do their sort of really cool, exciting things. And then we think they go into some of the pulsars populations, but it looks like most pulsars are, pulsars are born with a range of magnetic fields. So only the ones where you get the most, the highest magnetic fields do you get these really cool activities that, that uh, do all these things. Most pulsars just have a run of the mill billion times Earth magnetic field. And then they'll just live for like a like really, really long time just spinning, spinning around. So there's sort of a, you know, a blurry line between where magnetars are and where the rest of the pulsars are. And as they age, they do tend to become less active. So an older magnetar is less likely to do exciting things, but sometimes, you know, sometimes we're wrong. Okay, we'll take two more questions and then we'll have a chance to do lots of other fun things for the evening. So if this is your chance to ask your burning questions of the, I don't know if you'll want to stick around for a few minutes afterwards sure. to keep asking questions. Uh, so we have a question here. I wonder if there's any geometric relationships between the magnetic fields of magnetars and, for example, neighboring stars, or I don't know whether the sets of magnetars together. So we've never found a magnetar in, in that's close enough to another star to interact with it. Because we, what we think happens when you dump, do 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 wrong way, when you start dumping mass onto a neutron star like this. It tends to like it tends to bury the magnetic field. So when you if it's close enough to interact and you start dumping mass onto it, it tends to just shove the magnetic field deeper inside, so it doesn't interact with anything. So once it starts to interact, we, we it stops stops behaving like a magnetar. At least we haven't seen any evi much evidence for magnetars existing once they interact with another star. Yeah. It kind of looks like a uh, wind blowing in the sail of a ship. Mm -hmm. Does this have any applications on space travel? Yeah, so that's what the Planetary Society was trying to do with this. So there have been a couple people have tried. The Russians had one up in the nine in the nineties or in the past anyway, and it tried to unfurl, but it didn't quite. So uh, the Planetary Society one, this one I showed here, only half deployed. Like the, the science behind it works, and people do want to use these things to, uh, for space travel. In fact, there's, uh, there's a program called uh, Starshot. Yeah, Breakthrough Starshot, where they want to send a space, a little tiny spacecraft to the nearest star, Alpha Centauri, and what they want to do is they want to use these, because, you, know, uh, you know, fuel is usually expensive, but if you get the sun to do all the, you know, if you just use the sunlight as, uh, as fuel, then it's great. You can just use the, the sun's light to push you faster and faster, and hopefully get between here and the next star in, you know, only you know, hundreds or thousands of years instead of, you know. 
if, so people are, it, it is on the verge of being a useful uh, space travel technology. Think what's against there is how a large mm -hmm. fraction, large being like 25% of yeah. the speed of light or something. Yeah. I don't, I think they just want to do a flyby. <laughs> <laughs> they, they want to, yeah. Yeah, they want to put a bunch of tiny, like, uh, cell phone size cameras and things on it and then really send the data back to Earth. Some, you know, it's, you're, you think your internet's slow. You, 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 if you're trying to send a signal from halfway to the near next star, you're not going to get a very good data rate. Yeah.